Welcome to Scripture on the Go, the Bible study podcast where we dig into Scripture in order to understand it and apply it to our lives as we seek to follow Jesus. Follow along with us and download the reading plan at scriptureonthego.org. Hey everyone, welcome back to Scripture on the Go, the Bible study podcast and vodcast if you're watching on social media. Great to be with you today. My name is Pastor AJ. Here with me today, as always, is Pastor James. Hey, what's up, everyone? And then Elder John Reeb is with us today. Hi, good evening or morning or whenever you're listening. <laughs> Whatever you choose, it's you're up right. to you. Um, you know, it's great to be with you today as we continue to tackle the book of Second Samuel. Mm-hmm. And uh, today we're going to be in chapters 11 and 12, if you want to go there. Uh, and then later on, we're going to be tackling the end of the book of Matthew uh, chapters 24 and 25, which have some end timesy stuff, right, some cool yeah. stuff there. But first, we'll, we'll pick it up in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And uh, this, these are, David is a really good king, mm-hmm. right? So David, um, you know, he's the second in the line of kings after Saul. And in general, he's regarded as by far the best king that Israel, Israel will ever have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he has a heart after God in general. Um, he's a powerful warrior. He's a good leader, all these things. In chapter 11, we kind of pick up with some uh, really <laughs> ugly spot in his <laughs> right. reign. Right? Yeah, you you kind of see the, the humanity of David where I think up to this point, he's kind of had this reputation, like you said, of that man after God's own heart. And he's, he, I mean, he had opportunities to kill his king and he didn't do it. Um, and last time we talked about how he was entering Jerusalem, you know, uh, dancing vigorously with all his might as the Ark came into the city, and uh, so you, you see that he's got this uh, desire to serve the Lord, and now we come across a moment of weakness in David's life. Yeah, that dancing thing, you know, without the clothing, I mean, that's a thing. That's right. Um, you know, if he was doing it at church, we'd say, hey, can you do it at the back, not to distract the rest <laughs> of them. But... That's right. And I was a little disappointed Andrew didn't do a, do a dance for us vigorously on Sunday, but that's okay. We can have him back on the podcast. Um, <laughs> But we're going to pick things up here, right, with this whole David and Bathsheba incident uh, in chapter 11. And John, would you mind reading that for us? Okay, sure. Yeah. In the spring, when kings marched out to war, David sent Joab with his officers in all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he said, Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterward, she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. Yeah. Yikes. Right. That ain't good. David. I know, right? What are you doing on the roof, man? Don't be up on the roof. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, and that's that's part, part of the issue is, David, um, I, I love how this is kind of lined out because it starts out by by letting the hearers know that David is doing something that he shouldn't be in the beginning where kings normally go out to battle with his ar- their armies. David's hanging back this time and he's staying home. So that's kind of the first indicator that something isn't right uh, in this story. In this, in this idea, I, I was looking at it as being lazy. Um, I mean, we can get lazy with what's going on in our lives instead mm-hmm. of always being focused and intentional. So, yeah, for totally. Sure. Yeah. So who knows why he wasn't off to war, but it would have been his normal thing to go out to war. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know in the past that he actually has great skills as a warrior, but he's obviously not employing those right now. Right. And um, you know, so he remains in Jerusalem. He's walking on the roof, which is not unusual because roofs in those days were flat gathering spaces. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and you actually are starting to see more of that in modern architecture. (laughs) Right. right? You are. Yeah. Mm Taking, taking it back. Right. Uh, But he probably knew better than to be gazing at naked women. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that. Right, exactly. Yeah, this is so this would be kind of the second thing David does wrong. He doesn't say, "Oh, wait a sec, I shouldn't be uh shouldn't be up here right now. This is this is sinful." He says, "Huh." 
<laughs> Interesting. <laughs> right. Yep. And so obviously he commits adultery with her, um, you know, and then um, she sends word to him that she's pregnant. And so, you know, there's, you can read, oh no, the lights went off on me again. <laughs> I thought I'd taken precautions here. I got to throw something. It works. Nice. There you go. You better have um, another article to throw. <laughs> ah, I thought I had it, but it's, it'll be my shoe next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so David, you know, he attempts the cover up. Right. Right. So Uriah, uh, Bathsheba's husband is actually off at war with the army. Mm -hmm. And he's like, if I get Uriah to come home on leave, then maybe things will look natural. Right. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, Uriah is, is a convert. So he's, he's a, he's a convert to Judaism. So it kind of shows his, his faithfulness and we'll see his faithfulness moving forward here, faithfulness to his King and to his God here that, uh, that he is uh, uh, determined to uh, stay with his, his troops. And so, yeah, so he invites him at home and he says, why don't you, why don't you just go home and visit with your wife? And, uh, and Uriah doesn't do that. <laughs> yeah, I know and, you gotta love that. <laughs> that's a, you know, and that's loyal. You said to the king, but also to his the, his fellow warriors. He didn't right. want to take an advantage that they weren't getting themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which man is that upstanding, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> there are very few people who would go. You know what? The other guys aren't getting to go home. They're not getting to sleep with their wives, so I won't either, right? Mm -hmm. And so he he sleeps at the door of the king's house. Uh, with with uh, all of the king's servants, mm -hmm. right, and uh, and does not even go home, right, and, and so David's like, well, crap, he didn't, <laughs> I can't even get this guy to go home, <laughs> and, and so what are you gonna do? And so um, David, you know, try, gets him drunk by meeting with him personally, right, mm -hmm. um, and and hopes that he'll go home after that and he still doesn't go home right yeah so so uriah is not uh going along with the plan <laughs> right that, uh, that david is trying to set up here to cover up uh the sin here because remember uh the the punishment for david and bathsheba both here was death and which is you know when when bathsheba goes to david and says i'm pregnant uh she's kind of saying uh, we're in it deep here, pal. We got to figure something out. <laughs> and yeah. this is, this is David's plan here. Yep. And so obviously at that point, he has to figure something else out. He sends Uriah back and he says to Joab, the commander of the armies, uh, Hey, when you're besieging the city, put him in the front and then withdraw mm -hmm. and, and, and leave him there. Right. Yeah. And, and naturally what happens is he, well, he dies. <laughs> exactly. So, mm -hmm. Which, man, if that doesn't violate so many different rules of, of conduct as a king, as a leader, as a fellow warrior, mm -hmm. even, right? Like, it, it's messed up. Yeah. And, and it's interesting here, too, that, um, so he starts off with one sin. And, the, and to try and cover that up, he commits another sin. And then he commits another one. It's just, and that's the way sin is. It just, mm -hmm. once you start down that path, you're going to keep going down deeper and deeper until... It's not going to be good. Yeah, and it compounds and compounds, and, and it gets worse and worse uh, as you go. That's a great point, and mm -hmm. and it's one of those. It has to be interrupted by repentance, which comes mm -hmm. from the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And and we don't see it uh, being interrupted at this point. We, we're not even sure we really see much contrition. Right, right. In fact, it's interesting because you see um, Joab when he sends the messengers to go tell David. I find I find this kind of interesting. Where Joab says, "Now, if the if the king gets mad and he says this, explain what happened." Uh, you know, preparing for the fact that you know David is going to be upset. Um, and then you read on. The messenger comes to David, and David's like, "Well, you know, sometimes folks die in war." <laughs> yeah. He completely just passes it off. It's just you can see that how that sin is just continuing to harden his heart, and uh, the the only thing that matters to him is covering it up and justifying himself. Absolutely right. You kind of wonder too: does this messenger is he starting to put a couple of things together? You know, mm, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was thinking the same because so now it's becoming known, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know. Yeah, you just can't can't keep these things private and secret mm -hmm. for long. Right. Sin has a way of getting out, yeah. right? Um, and so, you know, this is this is what David's gotten himself into. Um, you know, the Lord 
uh, appears to the prophet Nathan and sends him to David. And Nathan comes up with a really interesting way, I think, uh, in order to show David how wrong he is. And it's kind of genius. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, mad props to him, right? Because I think going to the king and going, you're in the wrong here, is probably going to provoke a big argument, right? Right, yeah. And he does it in a way that uh, that he can that David understands, right? He uses that, that uh, um, imagery of a shepherd, right? And, uh, and a sheep. And, um, and then David uh, uh, is, gets upset with this parable. It's in verse five, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man in this parable, they, uh, Nathan told. And he said well, and to Nathan, Not to get too far ahead, but yep. so the parable, just so people who don't, don't know, yeah. is, is he says, hey, you know, there's this poor man who had like one sheep and the rich right. man basically takes the poor man's sheep. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and David's like, this is terrible. Like mm-hmm. this is an injustice that needs to be corrected. And, and now go ahead. Sorry. I want right, to make yeah. sure people knew. Yeah. And then verse five, he says, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man in the, in the, in the that stole the sheep in the story. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So it's interesting how uh, David is convicting himself, right? <laughs> Yeah, we all want justice done when it's against others who've committed yeah. uh, crimes, not against us, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so then uh, Nathan, right, says to David, "You are the man." Right. Yeah. And an interesting story from from my life in college. I went to a private school, and um, we would have floor shirts with words, you know, you know, fun little quippy phrases that uh, that the you know, girls and guys dorms would have. And and one floor decided that to put a scripture verse on theirs, and their scripture verse was this one, because you are the man, right? And it's good. You know, it's a thing we say. You're the man. Uh, but they completely took that out of context, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously just Google a verse to use um, without understanding the context of this phrase. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be this man, right? You don't want to be this man. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll tell you this. So what I find really interesting here is, um, so Nathan comes to David and, and right. And he says, you're the man, you did this horrible thing. Um, you know, uh, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your house. Right. Um, you know, there's sort of this curse of you're going to have dissension with your wives and the child will die um, and all of this stuff. And he's basically coming at David much like uh, Samuel, the prophet came at Saul and said, you're in the wrong here. um, And this bad thing is going to happen to you. This curse on your reign as king is going to happen to you because of what you did wrong. Mm -hmm. But the response is totally different, right? So Saul, he's just like, well, whatever. (laughs) Right. But David actually feels contrition. Yeah, it, um, let's see here. I'm looking for the verse. Uh, let's see here. Uh, t- uh, David said to Nathan here in verse 13, I, I've sinned against the Lord. So all this is, uh, the, the Nathan has laid this before him. And instead of saying, oh, well, that kind of stinks, he says, I have sinned. He understands uh, what, what, uh, that what he's done is wrong and that it's, he sinned in the eyes of God. Um, and then uh, Nathan says to him, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. So what he deserved, which was death, he doesn't receive. He says, nevertheless, because this deed you have utter, uh, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house, so he left. And so, what this shows us is that you know, forgiveness, ultimate forgiveness, and being right with God is is available for David. But sometimes, forgiveness does not mean that we don't struggle and suffer the natural consequences of the things we do. I was really impressed too, just with David, how quickly he admitted it. He saw it clearly and there wasn't any excuses. There wasn't any hemming and hawing. It was like, you're right. I did that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And no ifs, ands, or buts about it. No denial. And, and truly, like we think denial and hiding sin is actually the way to appear righteous before people. But, uh, you know, it's and, and maybe it works. But um, acknowledging sin before God is actually the way to finding everlasting and true peace uh, mm-hmm. in life. Um, because, you know, those sins and will God- always haunt you unless you actually get out with them. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. 
and God loves that. And he, I mean, when you repent like that, we're all going to sin. Mm -hmm. But when we repent just so quickly and easily as David did here, that's got to just bless God's heart. Right. And even, even in Psalm 51, the Psalm that David writes after this whole event, he says, a broken and contrite heart, O Lord, you will not despise. So when, when we, when our hearts are broken and when we uh, confess and admit where we've fallen short, the Lord rejoices and, and wants us to come to him and admit those things so that he can deliver the grace that he wants to deliver to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also find it really interesting too that like um, you know there are times in scripture that God relents from whatever curses or disaster he pronounces on people because of their uh, repentance mm -hmm. um, and how they heed his word. And so David actually he acts under that potential, you know so he he continues to pray and fast that the Lord would spare the child. Uh, and the child still dies, but you know David he kind of takes this posture of you never know what God will do. Mm -hmm. um, if you show some repentance and some devotion and, um, man, you would just, you would love to have seen that attitude from Saul and it shows where right. David is a totally different man. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And you see, um, and when you compare these two stories, you also see God's consistency and faithfulness to his word too, right? Mm. It, it, you know, David is forgiven, but he's also going to, you know, suffer the consequences of those things. Um, and also in Saul's case, <laughs> uh, he, he was faithful to his word that, that Saul was not going to be king anymore and that uh, not one member of his family would be, you know, have the throne at all. Yep, absolutely. So I think, I don't know what you guys get out of this. I get out of this one, um, you know, don't be looking at, at naked women on the roof. Um, <laughs> but it's a good a start. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much I think we can get out of this. Yeah, one. for sure. Uh, um, you know, not, I think there has to be a, a, a sense of, you know, especially as guys, but also some women, right? There's a real pull toward um, some of that mm -hmm. desire, right? And, and what our eyes see uh, can have a real grab on us, right? And so just mm -hmm. being careful what we consume uh, and see and, and because that can feed those sinful desires within us, I think is one thing I'm taking away. Right. And keeping our focus on, on God, on, on the intentional, not, not getting lazy and just being, you know, what's going on, but rather focusing on what's important at, at that point in time. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that, um, you know, God wants us to tell the truth, right? He wants us to, uh, to repent and come forward with when we've fallen short and, and done things because you see david just continues to add to uh the 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 sin um and instead of just coming clean right off the gate so uh, yeah. coming clean with god and, and confessing those sins uh, he does not despise that and he welcomes that and that's a good point that john made and it probably lends itself to, to thinking if you find yourself covering up your sin mm -hmm. right yeah that's probably a good sign to, to begin to interrupt that with some some repentance. Yeah, good though. point. Good mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So <laughs> let's let's move along to our New Testament for today. So uh, we chose to focus on the Old Testament reading for May sixth. Uh, we're now going to focus on the New Testament reading for May seventh and eighth. Um, in in Matthew twenty four and twenty five, what we find is that there are a lot of teachings and parables and sayings regarding the end times, and and that God is going to come back. And he's going to remake the world good again, but there's going to be um, an unpredictability there, and there's going to be a judgment there mm -hmm. of when that yeah. happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, when you get into to chapter 24, uh, the disciples are with uh, with Jesus on the Mount of Olives. It's kind of getting near the end of his life here, um, and uh, the disciples ask. They say, "Tell us when these things will happen." So the, the destruction of the temple and those kinds of things. And what sign will be uh, of your coming and the close of the age? So uh, as, as we were talking beforehand, John pointed out that, you know, Jesus sets out to answer both of these questions for the disciples. Yeah, yeah there, there are two different questions. One is, when will the temple be destroyed? And the other then is that longer term view. So obviously they already knew that he was going to come again at this mm -hmm. point to be asking mm -hmm. that kind of a question. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things he keeps repeatedly saying, right? <laughs> is that he's going to get, you know, he's going to die and rise again and then come again. 
um, and, and somehow that it keeps going over their heads, right? But it, <laughs> at this point, it may start to be actually uh, taking root in their minds. Mm -hmm. right. um, but yeah, so he often has foretold the destruction of the temple, um, you know, using a little bit of double speak about his own body, right? That his mm -hmm. body is the true temple uh, that will be destroyed and, and risen again. But then some of this actually pertains to the actual temple, mm -hmm. Jerusalem too. Right. Yeah. And I love how at the beginning of chapter 24, um, I'll just read those couple verses. He says, Jesus left the temple and was going away with his disciples. And when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, you see all these, don't you, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And I, and I, this is interesting to me because uh, it, it, we see ourselves a lot of times in the disciples. And I think we see ourselves in the disciples here because I think when we go through our lives, we, we lift up and look at those things in the world around us as things that are, are great and amazing where we draw some kind of meaning from those things. And Jesus is saying to them here, uh, this is, this is not what's important. In fact, it's mm -hmm. going to be destroyed. Um, and, and let me tell you about <laughs> what that's going to, what that's going to look like when it happens. And that destruction too, uh, the temple was obviously a very beautiful building. Mm -hmm. And in my notes here, it says that some of those stones were 37 and a half feet long and 12 feet high and 18 feet wide. Those mm. are huge. And Jesus yeah. says, they're not going to be standing. And they were later <laughs> right. on. Or later on, yeah. I mean, I've bench pressed one or two of those, but uh, <laughs> man. In your Indeed. dreams. <laughs> Oh man, even in my dreams, I just want to lift the bar. So, <laughs> um, but you know, so there's obviously here some stuff going on where he's like, yeah, um, you know, earthly things are perishable right. and there's going to be some chaos to come. What's important here is where your hearts and minds are at in the worship of the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but he does kind of give a little bit of a sign, right. Of, of when, of what to expect in the end. Right. Yeah, so in verse four, he, see, he answers them. He says, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and, and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So this here, Jesus is really kind of uh, taking, I think, a wide view of, of what's to come. And I, I, the thing I, I really am drawn to in this part is where Jesus says, you're going to hear about these wars, these rumors of wars, but don't freak out. <laughs> these things are going to happen. Yeah, they will happen. I think often there's this understanding that the end will come when things get really bad, mm -hmm. right? And there's some support for that here. But actually it says the end will come when the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to all nations and to right. the ends of the earth, right? And I actually mm -hmm. think that's really cool because you actually are participating in, in bringing about the end of the world when you share the gospel. Right, that's absolutely. A powerful thing. Right, yeah, and, and that's, a, yeah that's, a, that's an important task that we have. The most important. <laughs> my 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 dad was a pastor his whole life. He grew up before World War One, and I remember as a kid growing up, he always kept saying during World War One, he was like, "Yeah, this is this is the precursor. The end is coming." All right. Oh, of course, yeah. it was called the Great War then. Mm -hmm. Then then there's World War Two, which is even <laughs> worse. And of course, oh, this is the end coming. And so I think every single generation that's ever lived has always assumed that their time was the worst. And the end has got to be near. And well, in the rest of this passage, it says, we don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. These things are going on all the time. Exactly. But I think, and I think that shows uh, what you just said, it kind of reveals the faithfulness of, of, 
God's people during those times because <laughs> they know what Jesus has said and they're looking for those, those indicators. And, and, um, and so they, they know what he's, he said and their faithfulness to him and his word is, is impacting their lives in that way. And in a way, maybe helping them to realize that Jesus is in control of all of these horrible, nasty things that happen. Um, and so we need not be afraid. Yeah. And I think for me, um, when you're trying to gauge, um, is it the end or not, which is probably not a good department for us to be in since we <laughs> are not God. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would look more at, has the gospel been spread to all nations or not? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm, um, sure. and we know that there are still hundreds of languages that don't have, uh, translations of God's word, that sort of deal. Right. Uh, I think they, they hope to start on every remaining translation, um, within the decade actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and so we're quickly coming to a time, I think, when the gospel will be spread to, to all nations. And I think mm -hmm. that's maybe a better indicator, but that's, right. that's not for us to figure out, right? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. But, it's you know, coming when it's coming. <laughs> exactly, right? And, well, and I think that's part of, of what this passage is saying, right? So he gets into this abomination of desolation thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so he's talking a little bit about how the Romans are going to come in and destroy the temple. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is, and, and, and maybe this is a, a fine hair to split, but sometimes when we read through these sections, we can be confused by the language that's used here because there is apocalyptic language in the verses we just read. But then also when we get into this abomination of desolation, it sounds pretty horrible, but what's talking about is the destruction of Jerusalem itself and, and that it's going to be destroyed and that it's going to, uh, it's going to be really a, a very trying time for God's people in Jerusalem at this time. So uh, that's what that, that whole section is, is kind of uh, looking forward down the road about 70 years or so when that will happen. Yeah. So that'd be 80, 70 ish, right. That mm -hmm, that happens. Mm -hmm. And so, but whether it's that destruction or whether uh, you know, it's the actually return of Jesus and the, the culmination of the, the end of the world, right. There's going to be some tough stuff happenings. Right. Sure. And, mm -hmm. and, I think to the point of the chapter, when it kind of comes into the 36 onward, uh, it says, guess what? Nobody knows the day or the hour, <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that that's kind of a secret, right? And then in chapter 25, I think the point is, since we don't know the day or the hour and bad stuff is going to be happening, uh, be ready, right? right? So there's this parable of the 10 virgins. Uh, you can read it, but it's it, the whole point of it is be ready for the bridegroom to come. Uh, there's this pal parable of the talents and with what God has given you, uh, be prepared for him to come back at any point and say, what have you done with it? Yeah. Right. And I, th and I think that also co coincides with the overall message of revelation. You know, we approach revelation. It can be kind of scary uh, because it's a really confusing book too, but the overall message is um, Jesus is coming. Will he find you faithful? <laughs> Um, sure. And that's, and that's, I think what he's, he's laying out here is be ready, be watching, be ready for me to come back. You know, something you, you were just saying, um, and AJ, you're summarizing this, it, it got me to thinking there are, there are still today people who believe that Jesus has come back, you know, this, you know, there's people out there saying, oh, it's going to be in five years or they're pick a date out there and that sort right. of thing. And there's a lot of people that believe that that person knows what they're talking about. But what it, to me, what it causes is that these people become those, um, those virgins that don't have their wick ready because they've said, oh, he's coming. I don't really need to do anything. I'm just going to wait for it now. Mm -hmm. Instead of continuing and being ready, being ready doesn't mean sit back and wait. It means continue moving forward, continue sharing the gospel, continue right. with your life, you know, do those things. Um, I think Martin Luther said that, that one about, if I knew that the world was going to end tomorrow, what would I do today? And he said, I'd plant a tree. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get after it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a friend of mine in high school. He had a, he had a t-shirt that, that said, Jesus is coming. Everybody look busy. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I think that's the point too, right? Is you can't plan for this thing, but you can prepare by actually doing right. what God has called you to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. And then, you know, the last one we kind of wanted to tackle today is this separation of the sheep and the goats. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 25, uh, starting at 31. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. 
Before him, all the gathered uh, will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then, uh, you know, as it continues, he says, those on the left, depart from me, you are cursed for when I needed all of those things, you actually did not do any of it, right? Mm-hmm. And so these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. What do we take out of this? So, so for me, that very first thing, um, if you notice up through verse 33, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, up through, through kind of right there, he, that, that separation has already taken place, all right? The problem that I see is that so many of us, we go into that second part and say, we've got to do all these works to earn that separation. Mm. But to me, what this, these verses are saying is that separation is being taken place based on our faith and trust in our Lord Jesus. So that's, that's been done. Now, the result of that separation, these are the things that we've done because we love Jesus, or that these are the things that we haven't done because we don't love Jesus. Right, mm-hmm. and so uh, to me, that's an important takeaway because otherwise, this was just so much of a um, I got to do these things so I can be saved, which is mm-hmm. just such the wrong attitude. So, right, yeah, and I, I love that uh, pointing that out because yeah, I think we do sometimes take a look at this and and um, not to say that what Jesus, the things that Jesus lists, are things we shouldn't do because obviously he's listening them there because those are good things that he uh, appreciates the sheep's doing, the sheep, mm-hmm. the sheep doing. Um, You're such um, a lemming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but he but he's saying um, you, it's good that you did those things, but those things don't add to uh, to your salvation any more than than what you already have. Well, they're like identifying markers, right? Right, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like hey, uh, the the people who had the heart behind these items and the faith behind these actions, right? Uh, those are the ones blessed because of their faith, right? Um, and the ones that demonstrated no fruit demonstrated lack of faith. Mm-hmm. And, and then also the, the, the sheep, the example of the sheep, they didn't even know that they'd done these things. Right. It, it was just yeah. their, their life. It was just a part of them, and they didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, that, I that, yeah, I think that's a testament to, the, like you said, the faithfulness. Uh, when, when you are following Jesus and you're uh, you know, in it as his disciple, these are the things that flow out of you. These are the things that that kind of come naturally to you. Um, you don't necessarily even know that you're doing them. Uh, you just you just do them because that's it's like breathing. That's what we do. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah. probably the ones on the back half, if they could argue, they were like, "No, we did lots of great stuff." <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and, and frankly, you see a lot, um, you know, as pastors doing funerals, right? And, and there's often a a desire to sort of talk up the deceased and all the good stuff they've done. And Mm -hmm. I think maybe a a better legacy is to, you know, they had such a great faith in the God who gave them so much that Mm -hmm. it it caused them to do all of these things. But Mm -hmm. really what they would want said at this today is it was all for God. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, what I think is interesting too. So at one point I decided um, I do at least want to try and do all of these things at least once, (laughs) you know, because I think um, if these are things that are examples of what is, beneficial for God's people to do as they put their faith into action, it's probably wise to, or, or a good exercise to go, okay, let's see if I can serve in these ways. And what do I learn from doing that? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, not as an earned forgiveness thing, but as a, uh, um, I'll bet God will use these things and teach me a lot through doing them. Mm-hmm. For um, sure. 
And so, by the way, it's insanely hard to visit someone in prison. I found that out. <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> Very yeah. difficult. Um, it yeah. might be easier to commit a crime and get in that way. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, but it, yeah, I mean. Why don't you try that and tell us how it works out. <laughs> yeah, Report okay. back, will you? <laughs> Roger that. Um, but I mean, there's a, there's a lot of these that, aren't, that wouldn't be that hard, right? Um, you know, some of them are really p- powerful right now, right? For those who are sick, you came and visited yeah. me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as we we think about a sickness across our land right now, um, if we're if we're reading all of these and going, I don't want to do any of those. Those all seem too hard. Those all seem like they carry risk or there's other people who are better equipped to do those things. And I think that maybe is a sign that we need to have a little bit of an attitude change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and to stretch yourself a little bit because you know a lot of times some of those things are aren't aren't exactly comfortable. Mm. Uh, you know, we I remember there's a, a men's um, shelter in Des Moines, Iowa that we used to serve in, um, and and they had a, a a place where you know men could stay there residentially and 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 stuff like that. But they they also served meals three times a day and on the the wall of the cafeteria was this was this verse and and you know sometimes some of the guys that would come in um they were pretty rough looking and they were mm-hmm. they were pretty scary but uh, the amazing thing is when you go and you, you you sit down and just visit and and ask them to tell you their story which they're more than willing to do by the way <laughs> uh, you really um you, you start to understand the the value in doing that it has a humanizing effect. Right. Mm-hmm. For sure. I remember, um, so years and years ago when Deb and I were first married, we weren't making very much money. So we were just getting by type of thing. Um, so we were on the receiving end of some of this. We have no idea who was doing this, but every week in the mail, we got a $10 bill from somebody. And we <laughs> still to this day don't know who that was. That's awesome. And it was, but it was, a ble- it was just a great blessing. And that happened for, I don't know, at least several months, if not, you know, maybe six, eight months, something like that. So Mm -hmm. it really helped us a lot. That's cool. Well, and in the olden days, $10 was like a million (laughs) dollars. You knew that was coming, John. You just can't set them up that that well. (laughs) I know, right? Yep, totally. Well, and, and, you know, it's interesting contrasting this idea of there will be a separation. There are there is a life that we're called to in order to make a difference as Jesus followers, right? And contrasting that with David's uh, sort of mm-hmm. fall uh, from grace, but recognizing that we're going to have those falls um, if we're people routinely in repentance and routinely seeking to go, you know what, God, what's the life you're calling to? Uh, that that's what God is desiring, right? Is, is for us to go, you know, we do mess up a lot, uh, but Lord, show me where I can actually demonstrate the fruit of my faith in meaningful ways. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm kind of taking out. What do you guys think? Yeah. I think that, I, you know, what you just said there, it, it is, it's this to me. Um, well, first of all, this idea of being prepared for the end times, but that doesn't mean we stop doing what we should be doing. And what we should be doing is living a life that represents Jesus. That, that is Christ like, um, and that, that not, it's not saying we're earning it, but we are, we are just so much in love that we want to just do what Jesus has asked us to do, which is mm. serve other people and share him with other people. At the same time, we're going to mess up. We, you know, we're humans. We're going to mess up. So mm-hmm. let's be like David and have his heart and ask for that forgiveness, repent and ask for that forgiveness immediately when we when it's brought to our attention, however it's brought to our attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I think uh, I can't really add too much more to to that, but yeah, just um, paying attention to um, how, how is, what is God calling you to do in in your life at at, at any given moment, you know, and how is he uh, wanting you to, what direction is he wanting you to go? Don't say no. I think the people on the, maybe on the left side or on the, the, the goat side were maybe said no <laughs> when, when maybe God put opportunities in their yeah, path. Yeah, goat in this path, not an acronym. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, when, when the Lord is putting people in your, in your path uh, to, to help or to serve, um, listen to them and, and, and ask him, you know, 
how are you going to work through this? I am a little, little intimidated, a little scared, but I'm going to, I'm going to trust you to do something here. Love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love the emphasis, uh, counting on God and living your values every day, starting with mm -hmm. today. Right. right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and more so God's values. But uh, thanks for joining us for the podcast today. Uh, love to kind of dig into scripture with you. We'll be back next week with some more great stuff. If you mm -hmm. have a question uh, about what we discussed today or anything that was in the reading that we didn't cover, we'd love to answer that. You can post that in the comments uh, or at scriptureonthego.org. And then we'd love for you to uh, join us uh, on the reading plan and follow along with us. Uh, you can download that at scripture on the, door, uh, on the go as uh, .org as well. And uh, we look forward to joining you next week as we seek to continue to journey with Jesus and mm -hmm. uh, grow in our understanding of his word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for tuning in, you guys. And uh, and again, like like AJ said, if you have questions, comments, just shoot them our way and, and uh, we, we would appreciate that. And we'll answer them as we can. All right. Thank you. Uh, nice I enjoyed everyone. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank John. I, it was great having you on, man. Absolutely. So uh, thanks, John, and everyone, and we'll catch you next time. Peace. Take it easy, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Scripture on the Go. We encourage you to subscribe to the podcast, share it with a friend, and head on over to scriptureonthego.org to download that reading plan and follow along with us. God's blessings on your week, and we'll catch you next time.